All right, so today we had an introduction two weeks ago, and uh, now we, we kind of uh, officially begin with Genesis. So let's pray as we begin. Dear Father, please be with us just now as we seek to understand the real problem, the problem of sin. Help us to understand the relationship between eating forbidden fruit and the solution, your life, your death. Be with us just now. Amen. Well, Genesis. And uh, we kind of, remember this is a chronological Bible study. It's very helpful to go through the Bible, to put everything in a chronological order. It gives a great depth of understanding to so many things. And so when we read the book of Genesis and the words, in the beginning, is this the beginning of the Bible? If you were just to cut and paste and put the Bible together, uh, does the Bible begin chronologically with the words in Genesis? In the beginning, when God created the universe. And uh, I think it's very significant what goes on in those first few chapters in Genesis. It gives a whole new depth of understanding. Let's go to John 1, which I think we could say chronologically is before Genesis 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. Who's the Word? The Word was with God, and the Word was God, Jesus. And so if we take out just a few words here in between, what this is really saying is, in the beginning, God was with God. Okay, so we have this eternity past that we really can't comprehend when God was with God, and we can look in other places. Kind of interesting here in Titus, before the beginning of time, have you ever conceived of a time, I guess that would be the wrong word, but a time before there was time. But anyway, there is an infinity past that we're trying to grapple with here. And we read the words here in Revelation, I am the first and the last, says the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. And so I think the meaning here is, go back as far as you want, go forward as far as you want, and I'm there. Now, th these words of Job, we're going to talk a little bit when we get to Job. We're going to put this after Deuteronomy, actually, because Job was written very early. But uh, God's somewhat uh, sarcastic reply to Job, and we'll, we'll try to struggle with why God spoke to Job in that way. But listen to this description. Were you there when I made the world? If you know so much, tell me about it. Who decided how large it would be? Who stretched the measuring line over it? Do you know all the answers? What holds up the pillars that support the earth? Who laid the cornerstone of the world? In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. What do you think those stars represent? Angels, intelligent beings. Um, I think uh, it's very important, and we're gonna make a big emphasis of this all the way through, that we understand we're not alone in this universe. Okay, and there are other good and bad intelligent beings. And I think the plan of salvation makes a lot more sense if we try to incorporate that bigger picture of things. Now, this is a book-by-book -book Bible study, so uh, I don't want to spend a long time talking about the creation-evolution debate. Of course, we could spend several months talking about this. But I thought maybe just in a few minutes, uh, we'll make a, just a few comments about this because, of course, uh, for many, this is a huge issue. We read the Bible and we read about creation, day one, day two, day three. Um, is this an allegory or uh, are these literal days? Well, let's bring up a couple of issues here. One is, I just wanted to make the point that uh, some of you may have heard this story, but in general, we tend to find what we're looking for. And so if uh, we are of a mindset that there isn't a God. We will look for every bit of evidence to fit it into that model. Okay, and those of us who believe in God selectively will try to put everything together to fit in that model. It is very hard to be objective. You may have heard of this story, Nebraska man, but there was a tooth found a long time ago, 1918, something like that. And uh, this was examined and really felt to represent... Um, something that looked like this. And there were drawings made and a whole family was constructed from this one tooth. And as it turned out, it was a tooth of a pig. Uh, now maybe I should have, to be fair, used an example of 
creationists using a little bit of evidence to construct a big picture. Uh, but the point is, it's very hard to be objective. The other point is, though, uh, faith does not mean we blind ourselves to evidence. And so I think it's very important that we not put our heads in the sand and say, um, look, I'm just going with the Bible and I don't want to hear anything about carbon dating and all of that other stuff. Okay, so I think we should follow the evidence. The one thing I'd just like to suggest on this is atheism very often is a strong reaction against a tyrannical picture of God. And so what I just wonder would happen in, in the world is if a true picture of God would emerge that would explain an all-powerful God in a world of suffering that would uh, explain God in a way where he's not made out to be a vengeful tyrant. And then perhaps there wouldn't be such a strong reaction to considering the possibility that there might be a God. Well, I wanted to just, in a little bit, in, in my own area of specialty, give some evidence, I consider evidence anyway, for uh, there being a God. So let's talk about the brain a little bit. Okay, and this is the one time I can go over a lot of neuroanatomy very, very quickly because you don't need to remember any of this. But I just wanted to consider a little bit the complexity of the brain. The number of neurons is, uh, continually goes up, and some people estimate there may be as many as one trillion neurons in the brain, which is an astronomical number. I mean, what's this planet? Five, six billion people, and uh, magnify that all the way up to a trillion, and each neuron on average talks with several thousand other neurons, maybe 7,000 or so. So the complexity of what is going on here in the brain is, uh, is just incredible. And I want to just describe a little bit what that would look like. Now, of course, evolution would say that out of nothing, no space, no matter, no time, no gravity, came something. And out of that something eventually evolved into something as incredible as the human brain. But let's just consider how the brain works a little bit. Uh, let's imagine you're out here in line getting your Indian food and someone asks you, uh, could you hand me a fork? Okay, pretty simple thing, right? Let's imagine though what happens in the brain and I'll go through this very fast, okay? Of course, you have to hear, right? So sound waves come in and is this a simple process of how sound eventually here through the malleus incostapes and through the cochlea eventually gets converted, whoops, to an electrical signal in the auditory nerve. Okay, it's obviously a very complex process. And then there are auditory pathways and this is actually an extremely simplistic drawing of uh, the lateral lemniscus, the superior olivary nucleus, where you can localize sound. Um, some of you that are second years might remember that uh, we explain this if you're at a party or something, you're talking with someone, but you really want to hear what is being said across the room, you can actually change the focus and listen to something somewhere else. So these pathways cross back and forth, go up to the inferior colliculus, up through the thalamus, and then to Heschel's gyrus. But Heschel's gyrus does not understand anything. This is the, just the primary auditory cortex. That's where the sound goes. Now it needs to go to a part of the brain where you can actually decipher and understand the words. And of course, that's Wernicke's area. Okay, so the person that asked you to pick up the fork, now you're understanding that in Wernicke's area, but you still have to pick up the fork, right? So what has to happen? Well, this area of the brain needs to communicate with many, many other areas of the brain. And so there are these complex connecting white matter pathways uh, that go from one side of the brain to the other and so that everything can be coordinated in an appropriate way. So we have a pathway. If you're going to pick up a fork, well, it might help to turn your head to look at the fork. And so there's a pathway here called the tectospinal tract, which goes down to the spinal cord in the neck so you can turn your head. And then it might help also to turn your eyes in that direction. So let's make it real simple and just talk about the horizontal eye movements, which come from this area of the brain, middle frontal gyrus. And then, of course, that goes down to the brain stem. Those of you that are second years, hopefully you remember just a little bit about this, the PPRF, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, the third nerve, other cranial nerves, in a very complex way that have to talk to just the appropriate eye muscles to move your eyes in that direction. Okay, what else is necessary? Well, just this whole process of the cranial nerves coming out here to the eyes to get that program just right, to turn your eyes in just the right way, uh, that's enormously complex. Might be helpful to see also, wouldn't it? So uh, is this a simple process here? What's going on with the refractory elements of the eye and the retina 
and the optic nerve and chiasm and optic tract and lateral geniculate body and optic radiations going back to the occipital lobe. Extremely complex, but the occipital lobe really doesn't see anything. I mean, it can, it's the visual part of the brain, but it doesn't identify a fork from a knife from a spoon. That needs to go to association cortex around the occipital lobe. So now you can identify that's the fork. Okay, so you've turned your head, your eyes, your visual cortex, you've identified the fork. Now you need to move your arm. Okay, so from the precentral gyrus here, about in this area, uh, and this is the left side of the brain, to move the right arm, to generate the necessary movement to pick up that fork. Now we make it very simple in neuroscience course. We talk mainly about the cortical spinal tract, as if that's the only one. But there are lots of others that we leave out that are critically important. You have to have a rubrospinal tract and a vestibulospinal tract and a medullospinal tract. And all of these may not be involved in actually moving the fingers and hand, but they stabilize the spine and they get you just positioned right to accurately pick up that fork. What else is involved? Basal ganglia, very important for movement, right? This has to be working perfectly or else we get what looks like Parkinson's disease. So we have the caudate, amputamen, globus pallidus, subthalamic nucleus, substantia nigra, all in the mix here so that this motor program is very precise. And then can you just imagine the complexity? This is about C8 of the spinal cord of the program that has to come down here to talk to anterior horn cells so that they all work together in perfect synchronous fashion to get the right motor program out through the brachial plexus, neuromuscular junction, muscle to move that hand. And then, of course, you need to feel it, right? So we've got all these sensory receptors in the hand, and, and we'll uh, go through all of these, but you've got to feel that fork, and then you really don't feel in your hand, right? You feel with your brain. And so there are these sensory pathways that go up to the brain, and there are four of them, and they cross, and they're uncrossed, and they go up and talk with the brain so that you can actually feel the fork. Don't forget the cerebellum, though, because when the brain is sending this motor pathway down, it has to talk to the cerebellum as well. So the cerebellum knows the intended movement so it can coordinate it, okay? But the cerebellum isn't gonna be able to do anything unless it knows what the hand is actually doing. So then we have these pathways that come from muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs, the uh, cerebellospinal tracts, which then communicate with the cerebellum so that it knows what is happening with the hand in space. And then that has to communicate with the brain just to pick up a fork. And then, of course, if maybe the person that asked you is someone you're interested in and you kind of like, <laughs> then uh, the limbic system begins to pump away and you have the amygdala and the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and maybe you're struggling to say something clever and witty and so Broca's <laughs> area is working. And so all of these things, I mean, the complexity is um, just unbelievable. Now, here's though the bigger point, beyond just saying it's a complex task. As I understand how the brain works, all of these things, I mean, I can't even imagine the number of individual steps that have to all be in place for anything to happen. The theory of evolution is built on the fact that with enough time, and you know, neuron A talks to neuron B, you're able to do a little bit, and that gives you an evolutionary advantage. And then the next step happens, a billion years later, you're able to do a little bit more, and that gives you an evolutionary advantage. But how this works is it all has to work for you to be able to do anything. And so for things to just randomly come together just by happen chance, and then finally the last few steps are in place and you can pick up the fork, um, it is not conceivable to me how this could have slowly evolved. And here's a brain scan of a patient with about a one centimeter lesion in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And guess what, the arm is paralyzed. So all of this, all of these pathways may be working perfectly, all together in harmony. And here we've got a tiny, tiny little stroke and it doesn't matter, you can't pick up the fork. So it all has to be working together and that's why I just, I can't imagine how it could have developed in that way. And then of course we've said Jesus is the answer to all of our questions. How did Jesus create? Well, Lazarus, remember in the tomb for four days, and if we're not sure if that story is really true, remember what was the evidence when he asked the stone to be rolled away? He stinks. So he was in the tomb four days. Now, I know some of you are just getting into pathology, but 
um, could we do a liver transplant or, or could, could we use some of his organs successfully in other patients who needed a liver or a kidney? Uh, no, I mean the brain, everything is completely destroyed after that period of time. And so raising Lazarus was no less spectacular than just <coughs> creating Adam from the dust. Okay, there's no viable tissue here anywhere. And so that is how I believe God creates. He speaks and it happens. Now, there is another view, though, which is perhaps that God used evolution to create you and I. And here, there's another problem that, uh, that I would have with this view, and that is this. Here we have God coming in human form and saying, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's enemies. The principle upon which God's kingdom operates is that the stronger serves the weaker. And, I mean, that's not just words, but it was demonstrated by the life and death of Jesus. So many places, but I'll just show a few verses. Let love make you serve one another. The whole law is served up in one commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. In Philippians, always consider others better than yourself. And in Romans, let your affection for one another come to expression and regard others as more important than yourself. So the problem with God using evolution to create you and I is what is evolution based on? It is a survival of the fittest. And so we would have God instituting a mechanism where the stronger kills and eats the weaker rather than serves the weaker. So um, there's where um, I would have some, some difficulty with, with that view. Now some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, we see survival of the fittest in nature. But remember, that's a result of the distortion of sin, the dramatic disruption. And we see that in Adam and Eve. I mean, after you know, God comes for a walk in the garden, and did Adam stand up for his wife and uh, take the blame? I mean, no, he's right away survival of the fittest mode. She did it, you know, I, I listened to her, her fault, right? So sin has created uh, what we see uh, in nature today. Okay, but that's not really what I wanted to talk about, but I thought I would just in a few minutes. But here, we, this is kind of troubling though, as you're reading along and everything is perfect, day one, day two, it's good, it's good, Adam and Eve, it's very good. And then what do we do with this verse though? In Genesis 2, he told them, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree, if you do, you will die the same day. So in a perfect garden, um, I've tried to think of a good illustration for this, but uh, well, just imagine you're adopting a couple kids, and maybe they're nine or 10 years old, and uh, you, know, you would fix the house up, you'd make it nice, you'd have a, maybe a playroom with toys, and then here the day comes, you bring them in, and it's all wonderful, but then after some time, you have to tell them, uh, you know, there's a cookie jar on the table. And I just have to tell you, if you eat a cookie, you will die the same day. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So we need to understand why in the world did God say this? It is sometimes assumed that God said, if you do this, I'll kill you. What is the meaning? How would they die? Well, let's come back to this question and uh, let's go on to the tree. Now, here's a very, very big clue that everything was not perfect in the universe at this time because there was someone at the tree, right? So there was a problem. We know even though we don't have a description before Genesis 1 of something else going on, um, here we have a very clever, cunning serpent at the tree. This should open up a whole window for us of trying to understand what was it that was going on that there would be a serpent at the tree. And I think we should tie it with the last book of the Bible. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. And in case maybe we're not sure who this is referring to, uh, John makes it extremely clear. The huge dragon was thrown out. Hmm, who's the huge dragon? That ancient serpent. Now how many ancient serpents? 
um, can we think of? Maybe we're still not sure. Name the devil. Maybe we're still not sure. Or Satan. Okay, so he really tries to hammer it home that you get the point. Who is this ancient serpent? Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Okay, so in understanding this, we really need to take the whole Bible to put together what's going on in this conflict. So I'm just going to show a couple of verses, but as we go through the Bible, we'll be continually coming back to this. This great conflict is extremely important. Um, here's a verse in Ezekiel. Let's see who this is referring to. Son of man, give the prince of Tyre the message from the sovereign Lord. In your great pride, now we'll notice this theme, in your great pride you claim, I am a god. I sit on a divine throne in the heart of the sea, but you are only a man and not a god, though you boast that you are like a god. Son of man, weep for the king of Tyre. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. This is a kind of a, a theme here that we'll try to point out in the Old Testament. Uh, there's the king of Tyre, but then it's referring to someone greater. In Isaiah, it's the king of Babylon, but then it re refers to someone greater. But listen to this description. You were the perfection of wisdom and beauty. This is continuing on in Ezekiel. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, is that the king of Tyre? Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, red carnelian, chrysolite, white moonstone, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. And I anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. Now, last time I talked about the lake of fire. Fire is a huge topic in the Bible, but every time we come to fire, uh, let's try to make a little, build a little picture of the fire. Remember the words, our God is a consuming fire. What does that mean? Well, this being walked among the stones of fire. You are blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your great wealth filled you with violence and you sinned. So I banished you from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride. There it is again. Because of all your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. It's kind of interesting. But I think this is referring to really the original problem. Rebellion occurred in the mind of Lucifer, who became Satan, who became the deceiver. In Isaiah, I'll just mention two more examples. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, and I emphasize the eyes here, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the Mount of Congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Does this sound like a problem with uh, pride, selfishness? It would seem like that's a very important uh, element here. Uh, in this uh, rebellion within the mind of Lucifer. And I'll just bring up one more because I think this is fascinating. Remember, Jesus comes, he goes out to the wilderness of temptation and he talks with Satan. And he, Satan said to him, all this I will give you if you kneel down and worship me. Now just think about, that. it's just incredible. Jesus is God in human form and one of his creatures is asking him to get down on his knees and worship him. What does Satan want? Ultimately, the power that he wants is our worship. And he even would ask God in human form to worship. And of course, Jesus rebuked him. He said, go away, Satan. And uh, this is not harsh enough. I understand that this is just about the harshest way to tell someone to get lost. If you read the Message Bible, it's beat it, Satan. Get lost. The scripture says, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left Jesus and angels came and helped him. I like thinking about this because the angels, obviously, they're watching this, right? And imagine you're an angel and you know that Lucifer is an angel and you watch this other angel ask God to get down on his knees. It'd be stunning. So they're right there. They come down and help Jesus. So let's come back to the tree. And the reason I think this is so important is... 
I think we would identify sin as being the problem. Okay, what is the essence of sin? Here, I think in this story, we really get the key element of the sin problem. And I think also, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that the methods that Satan used to deceive those angels in heaven are similar to the methods? I mean, he's probably refined this to a pure art form at this point, and now Eve at the tree. So this gives us some insights about what might have happened in heaven. So let's read this very carefully. And really, this is a three-pronged lie that Satan brought to Eve. Now, the serpent was more crafty, cunning, subtle than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, what's the problem with those words? Is there anything untrue about those words? Yeah. Um, I heard someone say, he's just talking about one tree, God was. You must not eat the tree, the, the, not eat from any tree in the garden. Read this in any version. And the implication is very strong. Did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Man, I can't believe it. You can't eat any fruit in this garden. It's unbelievable. God is not a God of freedom. You're not really free, Eve. You can't eat any of this wonderful fruit around here. And of course, the words of God were, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except that one. Okay, so the very subtle deception here to create in the mind of Eve is God really hasn't made me free. Okay, but just wait, it gets worse. She defends God. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. Now, do we have on record God saying, don't touch it? No, it's kind of interesting here that Eve adds that, that we're not even to touch it. But now Satan really goes in for the kill. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. Now, is this very damaging here? What's the implication of the words? That's not true, you will not die. God has just lied to you. God's an untrustworthy liar. What other meaning could there be? I mean, as Eve is thinking about this, why would God lie to me? And also, if it's not true that eating this fruit will lead to death, if that is not true, then why would God threaten with death something that really might be for my own good? It's really making God out to be a, kind of a monster here. And it goes on. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. And in a sense, that's true, isn't it? She, they did learn what is good and what is bad. But the implication here is, Eve, you're really not good enough. And if you ate this fruit, boy, you would enter into an incredible state. And look, a snake. I'm a snake. I ate the fruit. I'm talking to you. And uh, so in the mind of Eve here, boy, I'm really not free. God hasn't made me free. God lied to me, threatened me with death for eating this fruit. And I could enter this much uh, greater elevated state. But of course, had God not made Eve good enough? We go back to Genesis 1. God said, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature, our character. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. Okay, but Eve now has of the mindset she could be a whole lot better off than the way God had made her. And so the woman saw how beautiful the tree was and how good its fruit would be to eat. And she thought how wonderful it would be to become wise. Very significant here. What is the sin problem? Ultimately, it's all right up here. Eve changed her mind. Okay, she believed the lie. She changed her entire mindset. And so then she took some of the fruit and ate it. Eating the fruit, the fruit was not poisonous. All right, but eating the fruit was evidence that her mind had changed. She now believed a lie about God. Eating the fruit was the action that confirmed what was going on in her mind. And then she gave some to her husband and he also ate. Okay, so this is the problem. But now notice what happens. That evening they heard the Lord God walking in the garden and they hid from him among the trees because that destroying monster is coming. We better run and hide. But the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? Now, haven't we all been taught that God is all-knowing? 
But I guess not. He was walking in the garden. Hey, where'd you guys go? Do you think God knew where Adam and Eve were? Maybe how long did he look before he found them? Do you think he knew? Yeah, I think he knew. Why did he come this way? I mean, he could have just whew, been right there. What have you done? Right? But why did he come in this way? Isn't this the least threatening way to do it? Comes out calling, where are you? And uh, of course, they're running in fear. Okay, now who changed in this story? Did God change into one who was coming to destroy? Or did Adam and Eve change? And I don't think God changed. He came in a very gentle way. Where are you? Adam and Eve changed, and they're now afraid of God. This is very important. Notice there is a time where Adam and Eve are not in fear. But after their warped picture of God was now in their mind, uh, they're now in terror of God. And after saying, where are you? Adam answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid and hid from you because I was naked. And I think it's just really interesting that apparently this, uh, the same Hebrew word where uh, the serpent was the most cunning, crafty, subtle, is the same word uh, that's used here for naked. Could it be that Adam and Eve recognized a complete change in their character, that they were now crafty, cunning, subtle, and that they are now trying to hide themselves from God? Okay, so the question is then, what is sin? And I think using this model of what happened when sin was introduced into, our, into humanity, is uh, notice it went like this. First of all, there were lies believed about the character of God. He's not a God of freedom. He's a God who is punishing. He threatens with death. Um, and um, he holds back things that would be for our best good. A whole bunch of things. God's an untrustworthy liar. Those were believed. And what happens when you believe lies like that about God? Love and trust are broken. Can you love and trust someone if you believe those things about them? Love and trust is broken, and then that leads to rebellion or lawlessness. What we usually call sin is really a result of what's going on up here in the mind that separates us from a loving, trusting relationship with God. So later on, Paul would say, anything that is not based on faith or trust is sin. If our trust in God is broken, that leads to sin. That leads to sinful actions. And this verse, which uh, may be more familiar words to you, or sin is a transgression of the law, but uh, listen to this version, New King James. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The word here, anomia, uh, nomia is law, anomia is literally lawlessness. So a warped picture of God, broken love and trust, leads to rebellious, lawless actions. All right, so let's, let's go through this now a little bit in a medical way. Let's think about it this way. We talk about symptoms, etiology, or the, the cause, the diagnosis, and then treatment. Okay, if we don't have the right diagnosis for a medical problem, we will treat in the wrong way, and guess what? The disease is not cured. So let's give an example here. I saw a patient not too long ago who came into the ER with headache, neck stiffness, and fever. Now, we could give that patient in the emergency room uh, pain medication, which we did. Uh, we could give the patient something to bring the fever down, which we did. But if the patient who came in with a headache, fever, and stiff neck now feels a whole lot better because of the narcotics and something to lower the fever, have you fixed the problem? No, you've covered up the symptoms. The patient's feeling better. And the etiology in this case turned out to be meningitis. Okay, so we can lower the fever, we can cover up a whole lot of things, but we need to make the right diagnosis, which ultimately would lead to appropriate treatment with antibiotics. Okay, now let's, let's try to apply this model now to the sin problem. The symptom, okay, we're kind of using this loosely now, eating the fruit, breaking the rules, which you'll notice fear is a big part of that. Okay, we usually look at these things and they say, oh, that is sin, stealing, adultery these behaviors, that is sin. But notice, these are really the symptoms of a much more serious underlying problem. Yes, Eve ate the fruit, but that reveals something very important that was going on. The etiology cause is believed lies about God, broken love and trust. 
So our model here is what is going to be the treatment for ultimately fixing this problem? And that is truth about God. What Adam and Eve needed was to understand that what Satan had told to them was not true. And, but how could God do that? Uh, some of you might have heard this. Uh, Tim Jennings tells this story, which is, I think, uh, uh, an effective uh, illustration. But imagine you're in a church, and um, your brother is the head elder, and your dad is the pastor. And you have, for a long time, had a completely trusting relationship with both of them. Um, and then one day, your brother comes up to you and says, um, you know what, I think uh, we need to pray for dad because he's embezzling money uh, from the, the tithes and offerings that are coming in. And uh, you're shocked, okay? You have a complete trust in your father, but yet your brother also has been, for so long, such a trustworthy person. And so in your confusion, maybe you go talk to your dad, who's the pastor, and you say, you know what, uh, I'm, my brother has just told me that you're embezzling money. Okay, and so what, you know, your, your dad didn't do it, right? It's just a lie. And so he says, he's lying. It's not true. I haven't stolen any money. And so maybe you're greatly relieved and you go back to your brother and you say, no, I just talked with dad. You, you're misunderstanding. He hasn't stolen anything. And then your brother says, I'm sorry to tell you, but dad is lying. Okay, and so the rumor breaks out. And uh, just imagine, how, how should the pastor deal with this? He could get up in church and he could say, um, I haven't stolen a penny. I have not done anything. But would 100% of the people in the congregation walk out and believe him? No. I mean, it's such a damaging lie. Would you put money in the offering plate? Would you have any doubts um, at that point in time? Yes, you would. So what is needed? Evidence. And so what would the pastor do? Bring in an accountant, an auditor. You go through the books and line by line by line, every single penny is accounted for. If that were done then the pastor would be completely exonerated and the lies would be dispelled. And so the evidence ultimately was provided by Jesus Christ, who came and said, I have come to show you the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember we read a couple of weeks ago at the end of his life where he said, I have fulfilled my mission, which was to make your character known. Jesus is the evidence that answers all of these damaging lies about God. But the last little point I want to just uh, tuck away here in the last couple minutes is that tree was put in the middle of the garden. And as we try to imagine, why would God put it there? Uh, I don't believe if there, was, um, if there was not a sin problem already, God would have put that tree right there in the garden. He put it in the context of all of these unanswered questions about God's character. Because after all, if you were an angel and you watch God here create Adam and Eve, this whole earth, would it not seem unfair if Lucifer here is banished off to the farthest planet? Um, no, Adam and Eve had the opportunity, the freedom to go to that tree. And I think the tree was really there for their protection. All right, They could only encounter Satan if they chose to not listen to God and to, to go to that tree to encounter Satan. But it brings up the point that we are really a part of this great, larger battle. There's so many verses. I'm just going to bring up a couple on this. But the earth is described as a spectacle for the whole world of angels, literally a theater. And I won't read the whole verse, but in 1 Peter, even the good news is described as something which even the angels would like to understand. What is going on in planet Earth is very relevant for those angels who have questions. And listen to this verse in Colossians 1. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself, not just you and I. God made peace through his Son's blood. Now, there was war in heaven, and something about the death of Jesus Christ brought peace. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven, not just you and I. So the death of Jesus is somehow important for sinless beings. And we'll need to discuss all of that. But I think it's important we understand that we are who we're battling with. The last verse here. For we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers 
of this dark age. So on this theory, which I think has a lot of scriptural evidence for it, of a larger battle and what the issues are, ultimately the character of God, we'll try to build on this as we go through the rest of the Bible. Let's pray. Dear Father, please be with us now as we work on these things in our own minds to understand that the real battle, the ultimate battle, goes on inside the minds of each and every one of us. Please give us evidence upon which to believe. Help each one of us to be convinced of your goodness and your trustworthiness. Amen.